Section 3 of No Animal Food and Nutrition and Diet with Vegetable Recipes by Rupert H. Weldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3 No Animal Food Chapter 3 Ethical Considerations The primary consideration in regard to the question of diet should be, as already stated, the hygienic. Having shown that the non-flesh diet is the more natural and the more advantageous from the point of view of health, let us now consider which of the two, vegetarianism or omnivorism, is superior from the ethical point of view. The science of ethics is the science of conduct. It is founded, primarily, upon philosophical postulates without which no code or system of morals could be formulated. Briefly, these postulates are a. Every activity of man has as its deepest motive the end termed happiness. b. The happiness of the individual is indissolubly bound up with the happiness of all creation. The truth of A will be evident to every person of normal intelligence. All arts and systems aim consciously or unconsciously at some good, and so far as names are concerned, everyone will be willing to call the chief good by the term happiness, although there may be unlimited diversity of opinion as to its nature and the means to attain it. The truth of B also becomes apparent if the matter is carefully reflected upon. Everything that is en rapport with all other things. The pebble cast from the hand alters the center of gravity in the universe. As in the world of things and acts, so in the world of thought, from which all action springs. Nothing can happen to the part, but the whole gains or suffers as a consequence. Every breeze that blows, every cry that is uttered, every thought that is born, affects through perpetual metamorphoses every part of the entire cosmic existence. We deduce from these postulates the following ethical precepts. A wise man will, firstly, so regulate his conduct that thereby he may experience the greatest happiness. Secondly, he will endeavor to bestow happiness on others, that by so doing he may receive, indirectly, being himself a part of the cosmic whole, the happiness he gives. Thus, supreme selfishness is synonymous with supreme egoism, a truth that can only be stated paradoxically. Applying this latter precept to the matter in hand, it is obvious that since we should so live as to give the greatest possible happiness to all beings capable of appreciating it, and as it is an indisputable fact that animals can suffer pain, and that men who slaughter animals needlessly suffer from atrophy of all finer feelings, we should therefore cause no unnecessary suffering in the animal world. Let us then consider whether, knowing flesh to be unnecessary as an article of diet, we are, in continuing to demand and eat flesh food, acting morally or not. To answer this query is not difficult. It is hardly necessary to say that we are causing a great deal of suffering among animals in breeding, raising, transporting, and killing them for food. It is sometimes said that animals do not suffer if they are handled humanely and if they are slaughtered in abattoirs under proper superintendence. But we must not forget the branding and castrating operations, the journey to the slaughterhouse, which, when transcontinental and transoceanic, must be a long, drawn-out nightmare of horror and terror to the doomed beasts. 
we must not forget the insatiable cruelty of the average cowboy. We must not forget that the animal inevitably spends at least some minutes of instinctive dread and fear when he smells and sees the spilt blood of his forerunners, and that this terror is intensified when, as is frequently the case, he witnesses the dying struggles and hears the heart-rending groans. We must not forget that the best contrivances sometimes fail to do good work and that a certain percentage of victims have to suffer a prolonged death agony owing to the miscalculation of a bad workman. Most people go through life without thinking of these things. They do not stop and consider from whence and by what means has come to their table the flesh food that is served there. They drift along through a mundane existence without feeling a pang of remorse for or even thought of the pain they are accomplices in producing in the subhuman world. And it cannot be denied, hide it how we may, either from our eyes or our conscience, that however skillfully the actual killing may usually be carried out, there is much unavoidable suffering caused to the beasts that have to be transported by sea and rail to the slaughterhouse. The animals suffer violently from seasickness and horrible cruelty, such as pouring boiling oil into their ears and stuffing their ears with hay which is then set on fire, tail twisting, etc., has to be practiced to prevent them lying down, lest they be trampled on by other beasts and killed. For this means that they have to be thrown overboard, thus reducing the profits of their owners or of the insurance companies, which, of course, would be a sad calamity. Judging by the way the men act, it does not seem to matter what cruelties and tortures are perpetuated, what heinous offenses against every humane sentiment of the human heart are committed, it does not matter to what depths of satanic callousness, man stoops, provided always that. This is the supreme question. There is money to be made by it. A writer has thus graphically described the scene in a cattle boat in rough weather. Quote, Helpless cattle dashed from one side of the ship to the other amid a ruin of smashed pens with limbs broken from contact with hatchway combings or winches, dishorned, gored, and some of them smashed to mere bleeding masses of hide-covered flesh. Add to this the shrieking of the tempest and the frenzied moanings of the wounded beasts and the reader will have some faint idea of the fearful scenes of danger and carnage. The dead beasts, advanced perhaps in decomposition before death ended their sufferings, are often removed literally in pieces. End quote. And on the railway journey, though perhaps the animals do not experience so much physical pain as traveling by sea, yet they are often deprived of food and water and rest for long periods and mercilessly knocked about and bruised. They are often so injured that the cattlemen are surprised they have not succumbed to their injuries. And all this happens in order that the demand for unnecessary flesh food may be satisfied. Those who defend flesh eating often talk of humane methods of slaughtering, but it is significant that there is considerable difference of opinion as to what is the most humane method. In England, the poleaxe is used. In Germany, the mallet. The Jews cut the throat the Italians stab. It is obvious that each of these methods cannot be better than the others, yet the advocates of each method consider the others cruel. As Lieutenant Powell remarks, this quote goes far to show that a great deal of cruelty and suffering is inseparable from all methods, end quote. It is hard to imagine how anyone believing he could live healthily on vegetable food alone could, having once considered these things, continue a meat eater. At least, to do so, 
he could not live his life in conformity with the precept that we should cause no unnecessary pain. How unholy a custom, how easy a way to murder he makes for himself, who cuts the innocent throat of the calf and hears unmoved its mournful plaint and slaughters the little kid whose cry is like the cry of a child, or devours the birds of the air which his own hands have fed. Ah, how little is wanting to fill the cup of his wickedness! What unrighteous deed is he not ready to commit? Make war on noxious creatures, and kill them only, but let your mouths be empty of blood and satisfied with pure and natural repasts. Ovid, Metamorphoses, Book 15 That we cannot find any justification for destroying animal life for food does not imply we should never destroy animal life. Such a cult would be pure fanaticism. If we are to consider physical well-being as of primary importance, it follows that we shall act in self-preservation, making war on noxious creatures. But this again is no justification for blood sports. He who inflicts pain needlessly, whether by his own hand or by that of an accomplice, not only injures his victim, but injures himself. He stifles what nobleness of character he may have, and he cultivates depravity and barbarism. He destroys in himself the spirit of true religion and isolates himself from those whose lives are made beautiful by sympathy. No one need hope for a spiritual heaven while helping to make the earth a bloody hell. No one who asks others to do wrong for him need imagine he escapes the punishment meted out to wrongdoers. That he procures the service of one whose sensibilities are less keen than his own to procure flesh food for him that he may gratify his depraved taste and love of conformity does not make him less guilty of crime. Were he to kill with his own hand and himself dress and prepare the obscene food, the evil would be less, for then he would not be an accomplice in retarding the spiritual growth of a fellow being. There is no shame in any necessary labor, but that which is unnecessary is unmoral, and slaughtering animals to eat their flesh is not only unnecessary and unmoral, it is also cruel and immoral. Philosophers and transcendentalists who believe in the Buddhist law of karma, westernized by Emerson and Carlyle into the great doctrine of compensation, realize that every act of unkindness, every deed that is contrary to the dictates of our nobler instincts and reason, reacts upon us, and we shall truly reap that which we have sown. An act of brutality brutalizes, and the more we become brutalized, the more we attract natures similarly brutal and get treated by them brutally. Thus does nature sternly deal justice. Our acts our angels are, or good or ill, our fatal shadows that walk by us still. It is appropriate in this place to point out that some very pointed things are said in the Bible against the killing and eating of animals. It has been said that it is possible by judiciously selecting quotations to find the Bible support almost anything. However this may be, the following excerpta are of interest. And God said, Behold! I have given you every herb bearing seed and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 But flesh with life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. Genesis chapter 4 verse 4 it shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, in all your dwellings, that ye shall eat neither fat nor blood. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. Ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or beast. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 26. 
Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah chapter 15. He that killeth an ox is as he that slayeth a man. Isaiah chapter 16 verse 3. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Matthew chapter 9 verse 7. It is good not to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor to do anything whereby thy brother stumbleth. Romans chapter 14 verse 21. Wherefore, if meat maketh my brother to stumble, I will eat no flesh forevermore, that I make not my brother stumble. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 13. The verse from Isaiah is no fanciful stretch of poetic imagination. The writer, no doubt, was picturing a condition of peace and happiness on earth when discord had ceased and all creatures obeyed nature and lived in harmony. It is not absurd to suppose that someday the birds and beasts may look upon man as a friend and benefactor and not the ferocious beast of prey that he now is. In certain parts of the world at the present day, the Galapagos Archipelago, for instance, where man has so seldom been that he is unknown to the indigenous animal life, travelers relate that birds are so tame and friendly and curious, being wholly unacquainted with the bloodthirsty nature of man, that they will perch on his shoulders and peck at his shoelaces as he walks. It may be said that Jesus did not specifically forbid flesh food, but then he did not specifically forbid war, sweating, slavery, gambling, vivisection, cock and bull fighting, rabbit coursing, trusts, opium smoking, and many other things commonly looked upon as evils which should not exist among Christians. Jesus laid down general principles and we are to apply these general principles to particular circumstances. The sum of all his teaching is that love is the most beautiful thing in the world, that the kingdom of heaven is open to all who really and truly love. The act of loving is the expression of a desire to make others happy. All beings capable of experiencing pain who have nervous sensibilities similar to our own are capable of experiencing the effect of our love. The love which is unlimited, which is not confined merely to wife and children, or blood relations and social companions, or one's own nation, or even the entire human race, but is so comprehensive as to include all life, human and subhuman, such love as this marks the highest point in moral evolution that human intelligence can conceive of or aspire to. Eastern religions have been more explicit than Christianity about the sin of killing animals for food. In the laws of Manu, it is written, The man who forsakes not the law and eats not flesh meat like a bloodthirsty demon shall attain goodness in this world and shall not be afflicted with maladies. Unslaughter is the supreme virtue, supreme asceticism, golden truth from which springs up the germ of religion, the Mahabharata. Non-killing, truthfulness, non-stealing, continence, and non-receiving are called Yama, Patanjalis' yoga aphorisms. A yogi must not think of injuring anyone through thought, word, or deed, and this applies not only to man, but to all animals. Mercy shall not be for men alone, but shall go beyond and embrace the whole world. Commentary of Vivekananda Surely hell, fire, and repentance are in store for those who for their pleasure and gratification cause the dumb animals to suffer pain. The Zendavesta Gautama, the Buddha, was most emphatic 
in discountenancing the killing of animals for food or for any other unnecessary purpose, and Zoroaster and Confucius are said to have taught the same doctrine. End of section 3